Morning, church. So last week, I read from the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> and as you might recall, I mentioned that there's tons and tons of verses in the Bible about encouragement. Well, I've got another one for you. But I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory. Basically, what is happening at this time is, is the Israelites are getting ready to go into the promised land. And Moses is telling the Israelites that he's not going to be the one to lead them. These are the words that he says. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because, because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then he calls up Joshua. Joshua is the one that's going to lead them into the promised land. And he says to Joshua, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Perspective. For instance, in the book of John, chapter 8, a woman is dragged in front of Jesus. They say, we caught her committing adultery. Moses said, we're supposed to stone people like this to death. What do you say? And Jesus uh, says, well, whoever hasn't sinned at all, you throw the first stone. And they all leave, and he looks at the woman, and he says, I'm not going to condemn you. Go and what? Sin no, Sin no more. Well, in the version that's being done in communist China, Jesus stones her to death himself. I mean, it's just sacrilege. It's blasphemy. It's wrong. It's, it's a distortion. But they're, they're trying to take all the religions and make them conform to the party agenda and fit the, what they want to do. They're doing it to the Buddhists, the Muslims, the Christians, they're taking their holy writings and doing that. They take kids away from parents who want to teach them a religion and put them in a boarding school where there won't be any religion. If they have a, a family uh, language, you know, ethnic language, they refuse to let that be spoken. They're trying to make everybody the same and God in China is the Communist Party. And so that's what we're up against. The Bible tells us that we're in a, a, a spiritual battle in this world. God and Satan are at war. It's not like two equal parties, like you wonder which one's going to win. God is a million times more powerful than Satan. He's uh, unlimitedly more powerful. It's not like Satan has a chance. Satan just has a time period where he gets to do what he's doing, but there's no question he ends up in the lake of fire. What the battle is, is will people listen to him or to him? Will they follow God or will they follow the devil? And the devil's line is pretty much this, do whatever you want. And God's line is, I created you for a purpose, follow me. And so we all have to make that decision of whether we want to listen to what God says, we want to honor what the word of God says, or whether we're going to uh, do what we want. Satan doesn't expect you to worship him. A few people do, but he does try to get you off track. The Bible uh, teaches us that the choices we make shape our lives, and they determine our destiny. The kind of person you are right now has been affected by the decisions you've already made. And the, and the place where you end up and the person you end up being and where you spend eternity is going to be depending on your choices. The first generation of Christians face constant opposition. Sometimes they were violently attacked. We've seen in the scriptures we read recently how they often were killed. And sometimes they just have someone come in and try to teach them something different than what Jesus said, what the Bible says. And so Jesus wrote letters to seven churches in that first generation. And uh, up on the map you see, we've talked about three of them already, uh, Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamon. They're all along the coast of the Aegean Sea. If you go across that water, you end up in Greece. And now today we're in Thyatira and um, Thyatira is the uh, smallest of all the seven cities. It's not important militarily. It's not important economically. It's not important religiously. 
It's not important um, in any significant way. They didn't even have a spam museum. <laughs> it's the smallest town. There aren't even any ruins of, of significance left for archaeologists to explore. Now, if you went to Ephesus or to Pergamon, two of the seven wonders of the ancient world were in those cities. There was this huge temple built to Diana in Ephesus and up in Pergamum. They had this huge altar there where they constantly offered sacrifices to the Greek gods. But uh, Thyatira, really nothing that they're famous for. They weren't on the map for tourism or anything else. But even though it was small, it was a nice place to live. You could make a good living there. If you were willing to work with your hands, you could do well. The trades did well. Uh, for instance, they did leather work. They did fabric. They, they raised uh, sheep and made wool. They did pottery. They worked with metal, bronze and other metals. And uh, they were most famous for a certain dye, a purple dye that they could make from a plant that lives in that particular area. Normally, purple dye came from a certain kind of snail. And it took a lot of snails to make a little bit of dye, so it was very expensive. This dye was not uh, quite as hard to get. But even so, the dye from Thyatira, uh, one pound of it sold for 3,000 silver coins. Now, the silver coin was one day's pay for a working man. And so you would have to work 3,000 days to buy a pound of that dye. Now, I don't know how much is in those little Ritz boxes, but uh, they're not close to that price. But purple was a color for luxury. It was a color for royalty, and they were famous for it. And maybe you, if you know the Bible, you know in the book of Acts, there was a lady named Lydia who came from Thyatira and was a seller of purple. And so that's the city we're talking about. Nice place to live, good jobs. Uh, but there was a thing. If you wanted to work in the trades, it was to your benefit to join a union. They called them guilds. And a guild was like a labor union, and they negotiated prices, and they uh, worked together, and they cooperated. But they had their meetings in the pagan temples. And they ate food that was sacrificed to idols. And uh, the meetings they had were sort of like those infamous office parties you maybe hear about where the people end up drinking too much and doing things they shouldn't have done. There's immorality. And all those things were happening at these guild meetings. And so Christians were saying, you know, we can't really be part of this. We're following Jesus. We can't be in this kind of a situation and doing these things. Well, that hurt them economically. Um, but there were others who, who were told, oh, no, you can do that. There was a price that a Christian had to pay to be uh, honoring to Jesus in Thyatira. But there was someone who came into their church who said, you know, it's not that black and white. There's some room here to work this out. God doesn't care. In fact, there was a teaching that was going on in the world at that time and shared with Christians that what God really cares about is your, your soul. If you come to God and you, you, your spirit is open to God and you let God uh, work in you and make you his child inwardly, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. Your body's nothing. Do whatever you want with your body. Eat whatever you want. Drink whatever you want. Get drunk if you want. Be immoral if you want. Uh, just do anything you want with your body. It doesn't matter. God cares about your soul. Well, that was not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says you're a person. You're a whole person. God cares about your body, soul, and spirit. He cares about your mind and your emotions. He cares what you think about and what your attitudes are. God wants to make you a whole, right person the way you were intended to be. In fact, the Bible tells us in heaven we'll get our bodies back. When Jesus comes at the second coming, the graves will open and the bodies will be restored of all believers who have ever lived. And in heaven, you'll be a human being. You'll have a body as well as a soul. And you'll live in the presence of God the way you, you were meant to be. Heaven is much like the Garden of Eden in its perfection. 
And so that's the message of the Bible. But this teacher was saying, oh, God doesn't care if you're getting drunk. God doesn't care if you're sleeping around. God doesn't care if you're eating uh, food or you're participating in idol worship. He doesn't care about that. And Jesus writes to these people and says, hold on. You see, here's, the, here's a principle. God's moral standards never change. Now you notice in our church we don't offer sheep as sacrifices. But that was the way worship was done in the time of Moses and of David. Up until the time of Christ, they offered sacrifices to, to ask forgiveness for their sins. But then Jesus came and he was the Lamb of God who was slain for our sins. He made the final sacrifice, the real uh, fully efficient sacrifice. And so how we worship has changed. But God's moral standards never change. The Ten Commandments don't lie, steal, cheat. Those are still the same. God's, God's sense of what's right and wrong has never changed. How to meet with God, how to worship God, that, that has changed. And, and you can go from one church to another and some are more liturgical and they read certain things and do it a certain way and others have different kinds of music but if if our hearts are open to God and he's Lord of our lives that's what matters to him it's the moral things that make us uh, God's um, people well in Thyatira uh, Jesus had some nice things to say about most of the people he told them that they were full of love and he loved that about them he said, I like the fact that you're actively serving, that you're persevering under hardship, and that um, you're growing in faith. And he said, you're constantly moving forward in your walk with me. You ever think about Jesus walking up to you and saying, I like you? Because he does. He likes you. He made you. He likes how you look. He likes the color of your eyes. He likes the things you're good at. He likes the things you're interested in. He likes the way you relate with people. He, he likes you. Now, he wants you to be a holy person, a, a person who does what's right, and so there, there will be things that he'll say, ah, oh, I didn't make you to do that. He'll lead us. He'll show us the way. But he likes us. He does. And when it came to saving us from our sins, Jesus made it simple. He said, I want to save everybody, whatever it costs. I will do anything so that people can know my Father. That was it. No negotiating. He cares about us. Now let's read the letter. In fact, we'll have it read to us. Um, watch as we play the scripture that we're going to look at today. It's the smallest town of all, but it's the longest letter. This is what you must write to the angel of the church in Thyatira. I am the son of God. My eyes are like flames of fire, and my feet are like bronze. Listen to what I say. I know everything about you, including your love, your faith, your service, and how you have endured. I know that you are doing more now than you have ever done before. But I still have something against you because of that woman, Jezebel. She calls herself a prophet. And you let her teach and mislead my servants to do immoral things and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her a chance to turn from her sins, but she did not want to stop doing these immoral things. I am going to strike down Jezebel. Everyone who does these immoral things with her will also be punished if they don't stop. I will even kill her followers. Then all the churches will see that I know everyone's thoughts and feelings. 
I will treat each of you as you deserve. Some of you in Thyatira don't follow Jezebel's teaching. You don't know anything about what her followers call the deep secrets of Satan. So I won't burden you down with any other commands. But until I come, you must hold firmly to the teaching you have. I will give power over the nations to everyone who wins the victory and keeps on obeying me until the end. I will give each of them the same power that my father has given me. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash those nations to pieces like clay pots. I will also give them the morning star. If you have ears, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus describes himself as eyes of fire. He sees everything. The Bible says there's nothing hidden from God's sight. And he says that's true of him. He has these bronze feet. You know, uh, uh, one of the hard things uh, for soldiers is if they don't have the proper footwear. Uh, back in Valley Forge, uh, maybe you've seen uh, how Washington's troops in the Revolutionary War, uh, their feet were bloody. You could see where they'd gone by the blood on the, on the snow. Uh, they didn't have proper footwear. But Jesus has feet of bronze. He walks where he wants to go. It doesn't matter if there's thorns or rocks. He's, he's self-determined. He, he can do what he wants and what he needs to do. And he tells them, I see, I do, I act as God. You need to listen when I talk to you. You need to listen. And they do, some of them. There's a place where he says something that's very similar to what God said about himself. If you look in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 17, verse 10, uh, God says, I, the Lord, search minds and test hearts. I will reward each person for what he has done. God says that. Now listen to what Jesus says about himself in this letter. He says, then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches hearts and minds. I will reward each of you for what you have done. People say, well, is Jesus God? Yes, he, he shows that to us over and over. Here he says what God has said about himself and says, this is true of me. I know what's in your head. I know what's in your heart. I see it. I search it. And I reward people for, for what they are making their lives to be. He's doing what God does because he is God. And he's the final authority. And so when he writes a letter, when he speaks to us through the word of God, yes, we need to listen. And he warns them in Thyatira, don't listen to that woman who calls herself a prophet. A prophet is someone who hears from God and passes it on and says to people, this is what the Lord is saying. And she says she had that gift and that she had that calling, and yet she was not teaching what God had already said about himself. She was contradicting it. She was boldly leading them to sin and do what God said not to do. And Jesus says, I've been patient. I've given her time to repent, but she refuses. She won't do it. And so I'm going to put a stop to what she's doing. And those who call themselves her followers, who, who want to know the deep things she's teaching, I will deal with them if they don't repent. There was a Jezebel in the Bible a thousand years before this letter was written. Her husband was Ahab, the worst king of Israel, at least up until that time. Very wicked man. He married Jezebel knowing she didn't care anything about God. She wasn't even from Israel. She was from another country. Her dad was a priest to a god called Baal. In fact, her dad had killed the king of Sidon so that he could be king. That was her dad. That's where she came from. And as a queen of Israel, she tried to make people worship those idols that she had learned about at home. She killed prophets of God. She killed them all if she could find them. And she told the prophet Elijah, who was one of the great men of God, I'm going to kill you. She was a wicked woman. And this woman in Thyatira, I don't know if she was named Jezebel literally, 
But Jesus says, you got yourself another Jezebel. And uh, don't follow her, don't listen to her, don't let her have her way. Uh, the, the Jezebel of Ahab's time came to a, a horrible end. And it was going to happen again because this woman would not listen. But these people can still repent. They can still turn back to God. They can do what God is telling them. And uh, they need to be ready to do that. They need to make up their minds who they're going to follow, what they're going to do with their lives. The Bible tells us we answer to God. He's the final judge. And in the book of Hebrews, it warns us, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a wonderful thing to land in the arms of a father who cares for us. To be in the hands of the one whose hands were pierced to save us. It's a wonderful thing to be in God's hands, but it's a terrible thing to answer to God for your sins. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We need to have a certain fear of the fact that the one who created us and the world around us, that that creator is going to make us answer for what we did with our lives, for what we did with his creation. And it should terrify us to know, I don't care what he says when we're going to have to answer to him. Well, the majority of the people in Thyatira didn't accept that false teaching. They didn't indulge in those sins. And Jesus says to them, I'm not going to lay any other requirements on you, just this one. Keep doing the right thing. Keep standing firm in what you know. Keep doing what I've already led you to do and showed you to do. If other people want to get on that road and go that way, just don't go with them. You just stay where you belong. The choices we make shape our lives and they determine our destiny. So let's be intentional. Let's be decisive. Let's choose Jesus. Jesus didn't come and die on the cross and rise from the dead and call us to follow him and say to us, why don't you kind of follow me? Why don't you do some of the things I'm saying? Why don't you give me a little credit here and there? He said, if anyone is going to come after me, let him take up his cross and die and follow me. He didn't mean you have to be crucified physically, but he said, you have to die to your own plans, your own desires, your own will. You have to lay them all in front of me. If you're going to follow Jesus at all, you need to follow him. Billy Graham said, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. I mean, a king is either the king or he isn't. Jesus is either the Lord or he isn't. And we have in our time a lot of people who say, well, I'm born again, but I don't do everything the Bible says. We have in this church a guy who's preaching right now, who sometimes makes excuses. I dare to say that to you because I know that it's common. It's what we are as human beings. And I, I know we all, as we think, is Jesus Lord of everything? We all can think and say, oh man, what I just said to my brother, that wasn't from him. But it isn't funny and it isn't okay. It's, it's a matter of coming back. And Jesus told them, he used in this passage the idea of repentance three times. Repentance is turning around. Repentance is saying, I'm supposed to go this way, I'm going that way. Repentance is saying, God, I've, I've messed up and I'm sorry, help me do it right, th right now. Right now, help me do it right. I'm going to pick up the phone, I'm going to apologize. I'm, I'm going to pay that bill, I'm going to do that thing. That's what he's saying. It has to matter to us. If we're going to follow Jesus, we need to follow Jesus. And the point of this message is this. Let's choose Jesus. Let's choose him. 
because the Bible gives us this instruction from Hebrews. You see it up here. Work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. You say, well, I, I want to be a Christian. I don't know if I want to be holy. That, yeah, you do. If you want to follow Jesus, that's what it means to be holy. And you can't kind of do it. You can't be pretty holy. You're either following him or you're not. And, and when we're failing, we need to get back on track. We can't just make excuses and say, someday I'll take care of that. I've got stuff at home I'm going to do someday. That one drawer, my workbench, the, the messiness of my car. I've got a lot of things I'm going to do someday. But following Jesus can't be put off like that. It's the urgent thing. It's the thing that matters. We're going to have communion today. Communion is when we come to Jesus' table and he says, do this in remembrance of me. And so we're going to think about him and we're going to ask him to talk to us and we're going to respond. That's what we do. So there will be some time for you to think, but I'm going to talk for a few minutes. I'm going to ask our servers if they will come and begin to pass out the, the um, bread and the cup. You might not be a member here, but you're welcome. If, you, if you're following Jesus, you're welcome to take part in this. Um, anybody who says, I'm following Jesus, not perfectly, but anyone who says, I'm, I'm sincerely following Jesus, this is your table. We share it together. And Lord Jesus, as we take this bread and cup, we pray that you speak into our hearts and draw us closer to you. Amen. When you get the bread and the cup, would you just hold on and we'll take it together in a few minutes. Go ahead. Today's August 6th. On August 6th, 1945, something happened that changed the world. It was the end of World War II. The Americans dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. There had been a couple practice bombs exploded out in the where nobody was, but this time an atomic bomb landed on a city. Tens of thousands of people died instantly. Some of them were evaporated. There's a, there's a wall, a, a concrete wall, and there's a shadow. A, a man was coming into town with his horse on a, in a cart, and that bomb exploded with such force, such brightness, that the shadow of that man and that cart and that horse uh, show on that wall. The rest of the wall was burned, and the shadow uh, stood out cart, the horse, the man, disappeared. Over the next few days, a total of 140,000 people died. It was a horrible thing. A few days later, three days later, a second bomb fell on Nagasaki with the same kind of result. You say, why would anybody do that to a human being? It was a hard thing. President Truman had a decision to make. The war had lasted five years. Listen, 50 million people died in World War II. 50 million people died in World War II. A tenth of our population in America was in the military. We had fought in Europe and in Africa, and we had fought our, our way across the Atlantic from one island to another. And now our troops were ready to step into Japan itself. The leader of Japan, Hirohito, told his people that he was God. I'm God. When I go down the street, you cannot look at me. You must look at the ground. You may not look at me because I am God. You have to do what I tell you to do. And I am telling you this. You may never surrender. The troops as we had those battles on those islands, Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal and the rest, the troops were told, you cannot surrender. You fight to the death or you fight till you win. 
and they would not re, uh, quit. There was a, a man in the Philippines who, was, uh, who continued, he would not surrender. 30 years after the war was over, he had not surrendered. He was living in the jungle. And so the people of Japan were told, you may not surrender. And they, they told them, take your broomsticks and sharpen the end. Take your pitchforks and use them to fight. He told the women and the grandmas, you may not surrender. You have to fight. You have to kill or be killed. And so our president said, what am I going to do? This war has to end. And he made the decision that he did, Harry S. Truman, and he said later, I never have gone back and wondered if I did the right thing. I don't know if he did the right thing. It's not my call. I'm not defending it. I'm just telling you why he did it. And then I want to tell you this. This month, my brother's grandson is going to Japan. He's going to college there. He's going to study. He's got friends who are Japanese. This boy's great-granddad, my dad, fought in World War II. He was on an aircraft carrier called the USS Hancock, and they followed the path across the Pacific with support for the troops who landed and fought. It was awful for everybody in that war. My dad was in Jap Japanese waters when they surrendered. My dad went to shore right after the surrender. I don't know why they did that, but I, I guess it happened. A lot, of, a lot of troops were allowed to go into Tokyo. He came home with a kimono and a Japanese flag and an old Japanese, uh, uh, not, not the old then, but a Japanese rifle. About 15, 20 years ago, someone asked him, you got any old stuff you want to sell? And he sold him the rifle for $20. And my brother looked it up, and they were going for 2000 Other than that, he was a very bright man. <laughs> Here's what I'm saying. Something happened that ended that war that was awful, and thank God it's never happened since. The average atomic bomb today is 25 times more powerful than the ones that were dropped. An atomic war today would be unthinkably horrible. But there's something else that's true today. Japan is a friend of America. They're a trading partner. They're a political ally. They're a military ally. We work together. We're close. Uh, you can go to Japan. You'll be welcomed there. Japanese people come here. They're welcomed here. My dad fought them, but I don't hate them. My dad never hated them. And what changed our relationship as Americans and Japanese people was surrender. Their dictator told them never to surrender. Then he changed his tune and said, it's time to surrender. And when they surrendered to America, America responded with kindness, with economic aid with opportunities to develop, encouraging industry. Um, there was a time when the Japanese cars were considered way better than American cars by a lot of people. And they didn't have anything like that except that they had surrendered. And I'm saying all of that not to be a history lesson, not to be a political speech. I'm saying all of that because God calls you and me to surrender. He said, there's only one surrender that I'll recognize, unconditional surrender. I don't say to God, you can have everything about me except what's in this pocket. You can have everything about me except Saturdays. 
You can have everything about me, except I'm never forgiven that person. No. God says if you're going to surrender, there's no, there's no negotiating. It's unconditional. And when you do, you've just put yourself in the hands of your best friend. You've put yourself in the hands of love. You've put yourself in hands that have nail prints in them because you matter that much. It's not a hard call to surrender to Jesus. It makes sense. It's rewarding. It's good for you. Any alternative is not anywhere close. So we remember Jesus. We remember what he did for us. We remember that he's coming again. Today I want to invite you to remember that he said, I'll do anything to save these people. And then he wants us to be willing to say, I'll do anything to show that I'm grateful. Do anything to show that this matters to me, that I value what you did for me. And so if you take that uh, little piece of bread, and if you'll take that, represent what Jesus did for you and me.